All right, this morning we're going to be reading from uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought of the morrow, for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Amen. Amen. I do welcome you here today. Um, glad that God put that desire in your heart to come and to worship, and glad that you said yes. And uh, good to have you here with us. And um, I was thinking about how people have so many different things in their lives that tell little stories uh, about who you are and maybe what you've been through and what you're going through. Uh, people have some jewelry, right? Rings and necklaces that tell a little bit of story about maybe family and love and commitment and those sort of things. Some of you may opened up Christmas gifts just uh, this past week that kind of was telling part of your story of, of, of family and, and, and love and a, just a little bit of what you've been through that really means a lot to you. I like to ask people from time to time, sometimes people I don't even know, strangers out uh, on the street or in the, in the uh, Walmart or in the store or something, I'll, I'll ask, so what's that story about? What's what does this mean? What's the story behind this? Or what's the story behind that? Um, does anybody ever do? Is it just me? Or sometimes you're just curious. What's the story behind some of the things uh, that you see? Uh, bumper stickers can even tell a story. Um, I asked a guy, it was just a few weeks ago, we were in a parking lot together and uh, kind of pulled in together, but there was a bumper sticker on the back of his pickup truck that said, uh, do you follow Jesus this close? Yeah, you, you, <laughs> you met, see, that was my reaction too. I'm not the only one that, I just thought that that was clever and I thought that was funny, but I am one who, I, I like to read the bumper stickers, I just do, and I will get up close to, I won't hit anybody, but I will get up close Right, Not on the bumper, but I will get up close so I can read what that bumper sticker says. And so when he pulled into the parking lot, it just got my attention and I read it. You know, do you follow Jesus this close? And my first reaction was I laughed. I thought, well, that is just, that's just pretty good. I'd never seen it before. So we're getting out of the vehicle at the same time and I thought well okay I'm just there's got to be a story behind that bumper sticker and my kids just bless their hearts they get so embarrassed when I start talking to people just off the street and they were mortified that I was talking to this guy who got out of his truck but I said you know what what's the deal with the Jesus sticker and uh, I was making kind of a, a joke out of it I was saying you know that's to me, that is just funny. That just, you know, because I get up close to people and there I read, you know, do you follow Jesus this close? I said, I just think that that's a hoot. And I said, I bet you get a lot of comments about that. And so I was kind of laughing and, and smiling. This guy's just serious, right? I mean, he is just, and he probably has a great sense of humor. I'm not saying that, don't know the feller. But uh, he said, he said, no, I just, I don't think that that's funny. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, maybe not funny, but I said, it is at least a good conversation starter. And he said, mm, I don't know about that either. And I was like, whew, man, I'm, I'm in trouble here. That's why my kids tell me not to talk to people. But uh, it got better. And I said, so is there a story behind that? And he said, you know, he said, there is. He said, for, for most of my life, he said, I just... Jesus was a part of my life, but he wasn't everything. And I was like, hey, I've said that before. And uh, he said, there was just, I just spent so many years not really close uh, to Christ. 
I just was far away and he said, I saw that sticker and he said, now every time I get in my truck, every time I'm looking out the window, every time I go by it, it's just a reminder to me, I wanna get as close as I can and stay as close as I can to Jesus. And I thought, amen, that's right. I was like, hey, and that was a part of his story. But a lot of things that we have can tell a story. Uh, when you look at tattoos, them just, they tell a story, right? They tell a story in ink. They just do. Sometimes, you know, you got the birthday or you've got a special event or you got a, a, something that's a special memory uh, that people put on their bodies. And I know sometimes they wish they have it an eraser and get that off, but that's another sermon for another time. But they do. They, they usually tell some kind of a story, just like scars. Right? We have scars. You might have some scars that tell some stories about what you went through. I have one third grade that reminds me not to, to play chicken on a sidewalk. Right? You're, you're supposed to do that in a soft area, preferably water. But I got a scar there, got a scar on my chin, just a reminder of some things that has happened. And so you may have some of those two trophies, right? Trophies and plaques. Uh, used to have boxes full of little league trophies. I have no idea where they are now, but I still do have one trophy and one plaque. And so why? Why do we keep trophies? Well, I think, I think a lot of times, at least for... Fellers, uh, for me, it's, it's just to remind, you know, there was a time. There was a time when I was young and athletic and friends around and winning. And, and it just, uh, it tells another story of your life. That deer head on the wall, right? It tells a story. It's not just a fluffy stuffed animal up there. It tells a story about what the weather was that day and all the planning that went into it and all the people that was there. It tells a story. Keepsakes. Some of you have keepsakes that are dear to your heart, right? Maybe they're in a box. Maybe they're on a shelf in a prominent place, but it's special to you, right? I, I just see an ordinary old box, but you see something that's attached to your heart. It means something to you. There's a story behind that. We just got through looking at the Christmas story. We spent all month uh, during Advent looking at the Christmas story. But it doesn't end there, right? God, God continues from the Christmas story to really give us the greatest story ever told. And I want to continue that today, that there is, there's more to the story. Um, Christmas is over. Um, but a lot of you still have maybe some stuff up, still got some decorations up. Uh, maybe some of you even have the Christmas tree. You may have the Christmas tree still up. Uh, so a lot of people, tradition, right? New Year's Day, take the tree down. Ours, right after Christmas stuff was over, our tree went down, but in our defense, we've had it up since October, so it's time. It's time to, 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 to get that tree down. So when you have kiddos that want the tree up in October, you put the tree up in October. But uh, some of you still have that up. We still have the Christmas tree up here at church. Uh, you know, this week it will be taken down, just like most of your trees will be taken down. Um, but the tree, and I want to spend the rest of our time today just thinking about the Christmas tree, and maybe you can think about that when you're putting some stuff back in the totes and the, and the boxes and putting all of that Christmas stuff up. Um, maybe you can think about some of these things that tell a story about God and His goodness and His faithfulness, uh, but the Christmas tree. Uh, it was the great reformer, Martin Luther, who really gets the credit for bringing the Christmas tree, or at least encouraging people to, to bring the Christmas tree into the home back in the 16th century. 
He said that the tree could, you know, represent and be symbolic of God's faithfulness and his goodness and, and just trusting in God and, and following him. And so um, we'll look at that with the time that we've got this morning. I did want to, I want to read Matthew chapter 2. This is after the Christmas story, so it's fitting. Matthew chapter 2, those first 12 verses uh, tell us what happened after Jesus was born. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi, those are the wise men, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, right? We know that King Herod did not like this new coming king, did not like that at all. He was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, Search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now, of course, we know that King Herod had, he just absolutely was not going to worship this new king. In fact, he wanted to kill uh, this newborn king. He wanted to kill Jesus, and so all of those things that he was telling the wise men were all lies. He was threatened by Jesus, and so from the time Jesus was born, there were people who were against him and who were trying to kill him. And so, again, so what about the Christmas tree? Um, hopefully when you put that in the box or maybe take it down, that it... Uh, that it will remind you of some things of God more than just, hey, you're creating some more room so that you can put some more stuff in that place, but it will remind you of, uh, of God's goodness. Uh, I know one thing, one part of the tree, of course, when we think of Christmas tree, there is still one gift down there. I don't know if that's mine, uh, but there, we think of gifts under the tree. Now, last year, and I'm sure you remember what I preached last year in between Christmas and New Year's, uh, I, I preached a message about the gifts, uh, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, everybody. Yep, you remember that. So we're not going to go into detail about the gifts, right, that were presented uh, to Jesus by the wise men, but that's an important part, and it's something that we need to be reminded of is God's wonderful gifts to us, that God is a giver, and he just continues to, to give, give, give. We just can't outgive God. His love, his mercy, all of those things, God is a giver. And he wants, uh, he wants you and I to be givers, not, not, not takers, but he wants us to be givers too. And so gifts certainly would be uh, a part of, of, of the story. But back to the Christmas tree itself, the, the evergreen. Now, some people point to the tree as, well, you know, that's, that's, that's pagan worship, and, and people, you know, worship the trees, and, and they did that sort of thing. And, and I did. I, I, I found a, an, an old fable, right, legend. Legend has it, and you may have heard this before, but legend has it that there was a guy back in the 8th century in Germany. His name was Boniface. And Boniface was in Germany, and in this town there were people who were worshiping trees. In fact, they were around this big oak tree, and they were worshiping Thor. They were worshiping the god of thunder. Now, that's, that's way before the Marvel movies, okay? So uh, they, were, they were out there worshiping around this oak tree, and Boniface, he didn't like that. 
He was a Christian. And uh, he got so upset by that that he went and he chopped down this oak tree. And the people were amazed. They thought, uh-oh, he will surely die when this tree falls. But Boniface lived and was fine. And so they were amazed that, that he wasn't struck down by all these pagan gods. And so as a result of that, Boniface was able to convert the whole town to Christianity. And what's more, legend has it, but out of that oak tree stump grew this beautiful evergreen tree, okay? So, I don't know if any of that's true or not. <laughs> I, don't know if, I don't know if that happened. It sounds good. Maybe part of it was true. Some of it was true. Maybe none of it was, but I do know the Bible does talk about evergreen trees in the Old Testament, the prophets, uh, Hosea, uh, Ezekiel. Isaiah, we'll read a couple of those in just a moment, but whenever you read about the evergreen tree, the Bible talks about renewal. Uh, a lot of times it speaks of how broken things can become new, right? That people can be restored, that things can change, and more importantly, people can change, right? Hearts can change. And so every time we, we see that, there's a, there's a renewal. In fact, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 19 and 20 says this. It says, I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. I will set junipers in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together, so that people may see and know, they may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. And so God was saying, you know what? In this desert, in this wasteland where nothing grows, nothing can grow, guess what? <laughs> I'm going to do the impossible. I'm going to put some nice, beautiful, green trees right in the middle of this wasteland. Only God can do that. And so again, a reminder to us that God can take some broken things and He can turn them into some really, really beautiful, wonderful, wonderful things. Ezekiel chapter 17 talks about the same thing and it goes on and talks about how God is a forgiving God that there's forgiveness and there's restoration. There's a, a time of reversal that can take place, really a, a day of new beginnings. And so the evergreen tree gives us pictures of, of hope and care uh, that your hope needs to be in, in Jesus, uh, this newborn king. But you do need to know that God cares for you that God cares about you and, um, and is concerned about the things that you do and, uh, and where you're going, and he wants to direct you. I, uh, the Old Testament uh, prophet Hosea, Hosea writes in chapter 14, and he says, Like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow, his fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. People will dwell again in his shade. They will flourish like the grain. They will blossom like the vine. I will answer him and care for him. I am like a flourishing ju juniper. Your faithfulness comes from me. And so not only do we have a forgiving God, we have a God who loves and who cares for you, gives you hope, provide shade, right? We just got through singing about God's our, our shield, right? But he's also our shade and he's our shelter. He takes care of you. Even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of struggle, and I know some of you, right? Just part of life, right? You go through hurt, you go through struggle, and you may be hurting right now, just again, just know that God never wastes a hurt, right? 
God never wastes a hurt that, that you're going through, a struggle that you're going through. In fact, really, God doesn't waste anything that, that, that happens to you. He's looking for ways to turn those things for good. And you might not see it now. You might not even feel the presence of God when you go through hurt and struggle, but just know that He's there that He's present, He's working, He's going ahead, He loves you, He cares for you, and He's working already to bring you out of those things that you're going through. Again, He just will, he just will not waste anything that goes on in your life. He will help you. He will help you if you let Him, right? I think that's the key. He will help you if you let him. The tree. Of course, we also see on the tree a star, right? The star. It tells a story. Um, in the Old Testament book of Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter 24, verse 15, uh, my passage, my heading says, Balaam's fourth message. It's one of the messages that Balaam got from God. Of course, when, when, when I say Balaam, you probably think about his, his donkey who talked, uh, but that's, this is Balaam, and, uh, and Balaam talks about the star uh, long before the wise man followed the star, and this is what he says. He, God had given him some things to say to the people, and so Balaam says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Right? Saying one day, right? One day there's a Messiah. He's going to come. And he says, a star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. And he will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skull of the people of Sheth. And of course we know, reading the, the gospel story, um, that it was the star that drew the wise man to Jesus. And just like God used that star to draw people to Him, I believe God is trying to draw you, right? Trying to draw you to God and to, to the things of God. And He wants more than anything in this world to have you drawn to Him. And sometimes, right, whatever it takes, God's not going to give up on you. He wants you to come to Him. That's what the wise men did. They humbled themselves, and, and, and I like that because these, these, these magi, these, these wise men, I mean, they were prominent men. People looked up to them and highly educated, and they were popular, and yet it says that the wise men humbled themselves. They followed the star until they found Jesus, and then once they found him, right, presented him with gifts, but even more importantly than that, they... They bowed in humility, and they worshipped the newborn king. And so the question for us, the question for you, right? The wise men followed and found. Are you following Jesus today? Are you following Jesus today? And that's a question that you, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to tell me, you don't have to tell anybody, uh, but you do have to answer that for yourself. Are you following Jesus today? And uh, that's the invitation uh, that God has for you. I think the star reminds us that there's a God who is above us. Uh, he's over us. He's over everything, and He rules over everything, and He calls you to to look on Him, Amen. Right? to look on Him, to focus on Him, to follow Him, and trust that He's going to direct your paths no matter what. And He's going to give you everything that you need. The passage, the call to, to worship passage that Jim read this morning, Matthew 6, right? That's what that passage tells us, but seek first His kingdom and, and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Well, what are all of these things? Well, all of these things are things that 
that you need. And God says, right, keep an eye on me, focus on me, follow me, and all of these things will be added to you as well. It doesn't mean that, right, it doesn't mean that everything's just going to just be fine and there's not going to be trouble. It doesn't even mean that bad things aren't going to come your way, but when they do, God's going to be with you. He's going to be present and he's going to lead you through that and, and in fact, out of that. And so the star, we follow that. Um, the other thing uh, that we'll close with, it's, uh, it's on, on this tree here today, uh, are lights. Um, lights. Lights have a story to tell. Uh, Jesus is the light of the world. He said so in John chapter 8, right? He says, I am the light of the world. And that's why Jesus came. He came to be that light, to, to bring people out of darkness. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And of course, the lost are in darkness. And uh, that's why Jesus came. He came to save us and to set us free from being in darkness. Uh, darkness, really, in the Bible, as you look through that, and it talks about darkness a lot, but every time it's just really living life without God. Uh, you just do your own thing, and, and uh, unfortunately, you do that long enough, it leads to darkness. And there are really three, three things that are characterized by darkness. I think darkness is marked by wickedness, rebellion, right? Wickedness, rebellion, and then misery. <laughs> um, rebellion, just, yeah, just, I don't really want you, God. I, I, I just want to do kind of my own thing, and so I need to keep you at a distance. I'm, I'm rebelling against you, right? I might not be shaking my fist, but I'm just rebelling, right? And so there's a, there's a, there's a, a rebellion that goes on that leads to some sort of misery. And I look at the, around at the world today, and, and man, that's kind of what I see a lot is wickedness, rebellion, and misery. Uh, I spent the past two weeks, the kiddos have been on Christmas break, and things have just been different. When you got, when you got all the kids at the house, and man, we've been... We've been going, we've been visiting some people, and we've been to a lot of basketball games over the past couple of weeks, and just out of the norm, and for two weeks, I haven't had the news on, um, I haven't been scrolling through headline news like I used to over coffee, and just for two weeks, I've just been out of touch with what's going on, and wow, what a feeling, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I highly recommend it, not that you become just totally uh, unattached from the things that happen. Matter of fact, this morning, I got on headline news just because I wanted to make sure that something hadn't blown up that I needed to know about, but wow, what a relief, because so many times you... Man, you scroll through some stuff and you listen to the news and it's kind of playing in the background and it's all just bad stuff. It's wickedness and it's rebellion and it's misery and it brings me down. And so for the past couple of weeks, I've been like, yes, right? Um, don't have to hear that. And that's why Jesus came, right? He's the light of the world. I don't have to spend my time in darkness. I don't have to spend my time listening to stuff that's going to bring me down. Jesus came to rescue, to redeem, to give you a life that's a whole lot better than you could ever, ever imagine. And so, again, the lights tell a story that you're free, and we, right, we already sang about that too. Free, right? Chains are gone. God's amazing grace. Don't have to do that. Don't have to live like that. Don't have to be that. There's transformation and there's change. Can't do it on my own. Can't do it with just a little bit of help from somebody. God, I need you to change and to help and to break some things in my life. 
Jesus, the light of the world. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, um, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. just means a lot to me. It's got a story to tell. Don't have time to tell you uh, what it is now, uh, maybe for another time, but... It's part of my story, just like the bumper sticker, you know, that was on the guy's pickup truck is a part of his story, and it reminded him of how he needs to stay close to Jesus, close to God and to the things of God. This passage of Scripture just reminds me that I just need to always just, I just need to, to walk in God's light. I need to walk in faith, just need to walk in God's light. I can do that, not because I'm all that or because I'm good, but because God is good and God is going ahead. And so he's already ahead. So I just need to just to follow as close as I can. I need to walk in his light. And so this is what John writes, First uh, John chapter 1. And again, John, one of the one of the dearest, closest friends of Jesus. And he says this, he says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and that in him is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie, and we don't even live out the truth. But, this is for us, but, if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that good news? Amen. Good to be cleansed, right? Renewed, forgiven. And so as we walk out our faith, and I'm just following you, Jesus, I'm just walking in your light, I know that I'm cleansed and I'm forgiven and, and I'm behind you and I'm in relationship with you. That verse tells just a, a great story. Just a great story. Just like all those other things that we mentioned at the, at the beginning of the message, lots of things tell the story. Even that little bumper sticker, right? Tattoos, scars, keepsakes, trophies, plaques. They all tell a little bit of your story and who you are. So we'll close with, what's your story? Right? What is your story? Um, and I just pray that, that your story is a story where you're walking in the light, you're following Jesus, you're trusting in Him, allowing God to work in you and through you so that you can let that light that, that's inside of you, right, spread out, spill out, into the lives of other people. That's right, this little light of mine. We sing, but that's true. Let your light shine. It's what Jesus really told us, Matthew chapter 5, right? When you become a child of God, sins forgiven, Jesus leader of your life, Holy Spirit comes to dwell on the inside of you. You're a son of the king, a daughter of the king. Now you're able to do some things that you never thought you would be able to ever do. And Jesus said, let your light shine before others. Why? Well, so that when they see your light shine, they too will glorify God in heaven. Isn't that awesome? Just as you're following the Lord and, and His light is shining inside of you, that you let your light shine as much as you can and as often as you can, and you'll be able to make a difference, right? A positive impact in the lives of people around you. And be patient, be patient. Sometimes it takes a while, right? You're walking and you're waiting and you're walking and just walking out your faith, but God is able to just do so many things. Just a, it's a, just a big old ripple effect how God can use you in some amazing ways when you just let that light shine. And so I pray that that will be your story um, and that that will be what people will talk about. When they talk about you, they're going to talk about uh, 
Maybe not trophies, maybe not plaques, maybe not a tattoo, maybe, maybe not the keepsake, but they're going to talk about, hey, you know, they, they were a person of faith, and, uh, and they let their light shine, and they've made a difference. And so that's what we want to do um, this coming year. And I thought about that, you know. I'll talk about that next, next week, about resolutions and all that sort of thing. But, but this new year, this, this happy new year that's coming, um, that we'll be able to let our light shine and impact those people around us. Amen? Amen. I'm um, going to close with prayer, and then after prayer, we'll close with the family of God, but let's first go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, and wow, thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your amazing grace, and so much grace has been given to us. Help us to show grace um, when we leave this place. Help us to be a people of grace and, uh, and just love you and love others. We do love you, and again, just thank you so much for being able to come to, to worship you, to thank you, uh, to know that you're right there with us. We love you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.